This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. West Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I'm Dennis Lawrence, my co-host Sandy Santos. You think? And um, I got a couple emails. Actually, I got numerous emails, and um, one of them dealt with you, Sandy. Okay. And um, people know why I'm here, what I'm doing here, and they, they know a little about my background, but they don't know much about you. So I thought tonight maybe it'd be nice to introduce yourself to the audience and let them know why you're here, what your mission is, and um, really what brings you to the set of Silent Voices. Well, Dennis, I'd be honored to tell my story this evening. I met Dennis a little over a year ago at a parental rights meeting here at WKTV studio. And uh, from there, we just started talking about silent voices, what was happening to the children in the counties in Michigan, uh, the silent voices that were not being hear heard. And I myself went through that with one of my grandchildren, and that's why I got involved with Dennis. That's how I became his co-host was uh, because I have a compassion and I have a concern for the silent voices in America that are not being heard, for the little children who don't get a chance to say where they'd like to be and what they would like to do, for those parents that aren't mentally capable of taking care of their children and the state putting them on so many drugs, Dennis, that they can't make wise decisions. So I'd like you to um, listen to my story Dennis, I thank you for letting me come on tonight. I'd like to, to listen to my story. I, I'm just a grandma, an ordinary person. I'm coming to you from my heart. In 2007, I came to Michigan to attend a wedding. Uh, while I was here, I found out that uh, my daughter was having some problems and that her daughter was living with some other people. And she asked me if I would take uh, my granddaughter. And of course, I said I would be honored was quite a process working with the state. Um, the state has no rules. The state does what they want to do. They can tell you they live by a set of guidelines, which they gave me, but they do not. They can tell you that um, they're, they're going to do this and this and this for you, but they don't. They can write in their little books anything they want. They can write down lies. Every caseworker can write anything they want. And if they personally don't like you, they will write things about you in the, in the report that is not true. Well, my daughter was in Ottawa County, so I dealt with Ottawa County CPS, and I would like to expose them as much as I could to the best of my ability. I worked with two different caseworkers, and I worked with their supervisor. I also worked with Judge Fayen, who I have absolutely no um, concern. I, can't, I don't care for the man. All he does is listen to the caseworker. He decides whatever the caseworker says, that's what he uh, puts on his report, and that's what happens. He doesn't meet personally with the grandmother. I had my granddaughter for a year, two days shy of a year. Everywhere I went, she went. She was three and a half years old when she came to live with me. I was a very blessed grandmother to have her live with me. At the time, um, I was allowing her, now she's three and a half, to sleep with me at night because I had been in, California, or in uh, Florida and she had been in Michigan and she didn't know me real well. Well, we instantly bonded and um, I was told that that was a no-no, that grandmothers cannot let their granddaughters sleep with him. Now I'm here to ask you people, Silent Voices is all about the child. Who is the state? 
Who are the case workers? Who are the little social workers to say whether a grandchild at three and a half years old can or cannot sleep with their grandmother? That is my decision as, a, as an American of the United States of America. I was born and raised in Macomb County. Who is somebody else who has never known me, never had any contact with me, who is able to come to me and tell me that is a no-no? They came to my house one day, and without asking, they went through my cupboards. They opened up my refrigerator to make sure that I had food. The, the system is a wicked, corrupt system. As, as you can see by the desk, I have been researching CPS, and I have found out that they have no rules, that they do exactly what they want. Now, I'm here to tell you that when I had my granddaughter, everywhere I went, she went. I was selling real estate at the time. She went with me to the office. I took food for her, I took crayons for her, I took books for her, I took a little DVD player for her. And by the way, at night when we would go to bed, we would take the little DVD player in the bedroom with us and, and watch little movies on her DVD player, the little teeny one that she had, and fall to sleep in bed, and she would fall to sleep in my arm. Now I'm here to tell you, is that not the love of a grandmother? Is that not the love of a grandmother and a grandchild who I'm not allowed to see now because CPS came in and said that the father who had never paid child support, who had never given a dime for the child, who had never called the child, who had never requested to see the child, he was contacted, he was told he had to take parental classes and given the child. Now I want you fathers to know I'm not against you having your children. That's not my point. I'm not allowed to see my granddaughter right now because of CPS. Because you see, what they have written in the paperwork here is that it has to be agreed by um, one of the two parents that the grandparent, by the state of law in Michigan, um, can see. They have, one of the parents has to be fit to, um, to have it be agreed upon that the grandmother can see the child. Well, my daughter is on medication. They gave my daughter medication and told her that she would not be allowed to see her child if she did not take the medication. One day she said to me, Mom, I feel like I'm not living inside of my body. I don't want to take this medication. But they tell me if I don't take the medication that they're not going to allow me to see my daughter. I'm here to tell you, is that what CPS is supposed to be doing? Or are they supposed to be trying to bring the family unit together? Are they supposed to be tearing the families apart? No, but that's what they do. I have heard of case after case after case. I have heard of foster parents that are killing these children, and these little silent voices have no response. They cannot say what they want to do. When my granddaughter went to live with her father, and I think she's being taken care of, but when she went to live with her, grand, her, with her um, father, one time I called her the very first time afterwards, and um, she whispered in the phone and said, Grandma, when are you going to come and get me? Now, I want to tell you, what do you tell a little granddaughter? What do you tell a granddaughter when she speaks in the phone and asks you when you're going to come and get her? And I had to say, Honey, you're living with your daddy now. Grandma can't come and get you. Now, I want to expose something about CPS. I could give some names right now of uh, the caseworkers, Joanne Nicholson, Megan Teary, um, who were the two caseworkers in my story. Um, I want to tell you what happened. Um, one of them went on vacation, and there was a, a fill-in caseworker. Now, they had contacted the father after I, I told you after three or four months, the father started taking parental classes. And they went to court um, for the father to start getting visitation. Now, I was not in court that day. I was home, and I got a phone call from the caseworker, who was a fill-in caseworker. And uh, she told me that I would do exactly what she told me to do. I have this all documented. And I was writing as fast as I could. She told me that um, I was to take my granddaughter to um, uh, McDonald's in Jenison. I was to pass her off to the other grandmother. I was not to speak to anybody. Now I'll tell you something. At, this was three years ago. I was 55 uh, years old, 56 years old at the time. Who is a little caseworker to tell me I can't speak to somebody? Who do they think they are to tell somebody they can't speak to another person? I was told to take that little child, to pass her off to the other grandmother, not to say a thing, 
not to say goodbye to Kylie, my grandmother, but I was to turn around and walk back out of McDonald's. Now, this was on a Friday afternoon, and I was to take her that Saturday, that same Saturday. I set my little granddaughter down, and I told her that she had a father that she didn't know she had. Now, let me tell you, this little girl's three and a half years old. She has a father that she doesn't know she has. She has a grandpa and grandma that she doesn't know she has. Yes, they did see her when she was a couple months old. They, they did see her. They did take care of her. Uh, my daughter had her, but I mean, they did see her at that time. But from the time she was maybe three or four months old until she was three and a half, the father was nowhere in her life, neither were the other grandparents. So I prepared my granddaughter that um, she was going to go see her father. So that day, I had to pull her off of me when I got to the McDonald's store. I got her out of her car seat. She clung to me, just clinging on to me, crying that she didn't want to go. I had to literally pull her hands off of me. And I'm going to tell you while that breaks your heart. I want to tell you as a grandmother how you feel that you are not protecting your grandchild when you have to do something like that, like that with a little girl. I took her into the McDonald's. I did say hello to Mrs. Nelson. And uh, when I got there, there were two people there that were not um, supposed to be there. There was only supposed to be the father, the uh, step-grandmother, and the um, grandfather. There are two other people there. I told her goodbye. I said that I would see her in a little while. Now, this little girl, my little granddaughter, did not know any of these people. They were allowed to see her for three hours and 45 minutes the very first time without myself or a caseworker with her. Can you imagine what that little girl was going through when she got passed off to somebody else who didn't, she did not know? When she got passed off to another grandmother that she did not know, all she knew was that I, who was taking care of her and loved her and was um, reading her stories and taking her everywhere I'm going, feeding her, caring for her, the bonding that was taking place between us, I was ripping her off of me and giving her to somebody she didn't know. What do you think that made that little silent voice feel like? Now, she came back, I picked her up, I stood in the, or sat in the car and I watched the grandfather uh, take her out of McDonald's, hold her, put her in the car seat, and they drove away with the other two people I did not know. I immediately went back to my real estate office, I called the police who came out and said there was nothing they could do. I called my, grandma, my granddaughter's attorney who uh, did not answer me till Monday morning, and I called the CPS hotline. Now wait till you hear what the CPS hotline told me. I said there were two people there that I did not know. They were not supposed to be there. And I don't know who my granddaughter left with, with the three people I knew, the father and the grandpa and grandma, but I did not know the other two people. The caseworker on call said to me, we were told there would be trouble with you. Well, wasn't that nice? They were told there would be trouble with me, with me, the grandmother, the maternal grandmother of the little child, the little blood grandmother of the little child. There would be um, problems with me. You know what? I'm trying to protect this little girl from the vultures of CPS who do as they darn well please. Now, let me go on with my story. They bring her back three hours and 45 minutes later, and Kylie and I go to... Uh, a local store, and uh, she says to me in the store, Grandma, don't leave me. I don't want to leave you, Grandma. We get home that night, and she says to me, Grandma, do they take little girls away from their grandmothers? Do you have any idea how that ripped my heart apart? Do you have any idea what the, how that ripped that little girl with a silent voice that couldn't say where she wanted to live or what she wanted to do? The next day I was to take her, and they were to get four hours and 45 minutes with her, I took her, and uh, they, they took her for the day. Um, I brought her home that night, and she clung to me for the next week like, there was, like she was petrified to, to leave my side. Monday morning, I got several calls, of course. I got a call from uh, her, little, her attorney, Danielle Potter, and she told me she would check into that, that that was not right what had happened, that it should not have happened that way, that either the caseworker or myself should have been with the little girl. I got a call from the caseworker. I believe it was Joanne Nicholson at the time, and I'm not afraid to expose Joanne Nicholson's name or Megan Teary's name. And I found out that um, um, 
she was not, the, the step-in caseworker was not supposed to have done that, that she made a mistake. She made a mistake at the expense of my little granddaughter, the little silent voice. She made a mistake and let people take her that my granddaughter didn't know without myself or a caseworker being there. She made a mistake. You know, it's time that these caseworkers stop making mistakes because they're only harming these little silent voices. I found out several months later when Danielle Potter, my little granddaughter's attorney, came to my house one night knocking on my door, we were discussing the case. And I brought up again the fact that uh, why did they allow that to happen? And she looked at me and she said, Sandy, did anybody from CPS tell you that that woman got fired? And I said, absolutely not. And she said what she did was wrong. What the filling caseworker had done was wrong. And she was not to allow them to take Kylie away from McDonald's. They were to stay at McDonald's with either myself there or um, another caseworker, somebody that Kylie knew. So I just want to expose CPS. That is my uh, message. That is um, uh, when we went to court one day, I'm kind of jumping around because I only have so much time to tell this story, but we went to court one day and um, Judge Fan from Ottawa County, and I'm not uh, ashamed to expose his name, um, he is someone who just is, gets paid and gets a paycheck like they all do, and they really don't care about these people. It's just another case. He asked me if I had anything I would like to say, and I stood up and I said, Your Honor, I surely have something that I would like to say. The court is considering giving this child to her father, who has never paid child support, who has never given me $5 for a gallon of milk, who has never given me any clothes, who has never called and talked to the child, who has never called me and said, what can I do to help? But the court is considering giving this little girl to him. I have done everything to take care of the child. I have done everything to, to the best of my ability and paid for the things. I even had friends, some friends of mine, buy Kylie clothes that year. They spent $100 on new clothes for her that year. My daughter would bring or would give me groceries. My daughter would give me clothes for her. Uh, so I had, a, I had a support system that was, was helping me with the little girl. And uh, right now to this very day, I have seen Kylie twice since they took her away from me. And one was, um, I went to a cottage and saw her, and it was an overnight visitation, but not with me alone. Um, she was staying with her other siblings, and I got to see her. Um, and I got to see her on her birthday uh, last March. I have called the father several times and asked if I could come and see her, and he always tells me, no, not this weekend. It wouldn't work out this weekend. That's how CPS and, and those that have children are pulling the support system away from grandparents and pulling the support system away from little children that want to be with their um, grandparents. And my little granddaughter said to me last summer when I saw her the one time, she says, Grandma, why don't you ever come and visit me? Now, I kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to jeopardize the fact of never seeing her again, but I have decided that seeing as I can't see her, that the next time I do see her, I will gladly tell her that the reason I'm not allowed to see her is because her father will not let me come and see her. Because the case system set it up and um, made it so I couldn't see her. Now, I'm jumping around again, and I'm sorry, but... Um, when, when I told the Judge Fayen that I wanted to, um, you know, I, I said Joe has never done anything to take care of this child, he turned it around and he looked at the father, Mr. Joseph Nelson from Cadillac, Michigan, and he said, I can see why you don't want this woman to have uh, this child. The audacity of that judge to say what he said to me when I did nothing but love my granddaughter is preposterous. He should be put out of office. He should never be able to be a judge again. And I, I pray that he does not treat his own grandchildren that way. And so I'm here to tell you that little silent voices need help. We need help to expose the court system. We need help here at WKTV on this production. We need help monetarily. We need emails coming in. We need cases that we can expose CPS. I have case after case after case on my desk right here that you would not believe. In California, there was a case 
where the mother, the foster mother put two twins in cribs and put chicken wire over the top of them and the children were not allowed out of the room. Where is the caseworkers? What is CPS? Are they destroying our families when they're supposed to be helping our families? Dennis, I've said it all. I've told my story. There's much more I could tell tonight, Dennis, but I'm going to stop right now because my time is done. But I, I'm asking the television audience, please, hear. Hear our stories because they're coming from our hearts. My story is as a grandmother, I am not allowed to see my little granddaughter right now as we speak because of what the uh, court system did. And I thank you so much for listening tonight. Dennis, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Sandy. That was very interesting. Thank you for letting me tell my story, Dennis. I have a lot more I can and tell. This happened in Ottawa County, Michigan? This happened in Ottawa and County. who was the judge again? Judge Fayen, F-E-Y-E-N, okay. Judge Fayen in Ottawa County. We'll keep him in mind. Uh, I think he should go on the Hall of Shame. Well, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, I'm a grandparent that lost my grandchildren. Okay. And looking in the laws and all the things, I, I know some. I know some grandparents have spent sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in trying to get their grandchildren back. And you know, I was looking at the laws and other experiences from people in the state of Michigan. And I'll tell you something. I didn't find one leg that I could stand on legally. For grandparents. For grandparents. I, I mean, I hear a lot of people say, well, they're your blood. They're your blood. And, you know, and true, but I don't see any laws that says they're your blood. No, um, there isn't. There let's, isn't. Uh, let's pull up that one law real quick uh, about the agency deciding. Uh, um, I'm not sure. There has I to be a quick parent. MC 34. Um, MC 734.A or, well anyway, I, I, I'm very familiar with this law and this was, we were hoping to be changed with the Amir bill that's coming up, but the adoption agency, whether it be the agency contracted out by CPS uh, in Kent County, uh, there's 100% contracts with the agencies which I, I often refer to uh, CPS in Kent County as the intake mm -hmm. services um, because they contract all the work out to the agencies. In Ottawa County, where you're from, it was 25%. And um, was there a agency involved in that or was it strictly It was CPS? DHS. DHS, Just DHS and C DHS, DHS. Yep. DHS uh, and in CPS. Your, mm -hmm. In your case. But CPS or DHS is the one to decide the placement of the child. And uh, when, when they go with placements, uh, the, the wording of the law is so vague that we can twist anything, you know, uh, maybe they, I, I know one grandmother lost, they used a cookie as a, an excuse. Uh, you, she's feeding a cookie. Well, it happens, DHS or the, the agency, in the, this case was D.A. Blodgett that was there at, at that moment, and it was about noon time, about lunch time. Well, uh, with workers there, you don't feel like putting a meal on for the child at that time. So gave her a little snack, a cookie, and they they referred to well feeding this baby a cookie. Um, in my case, you know, they use so many. Uh, things that uh, twisted so many things around uh, in my case too and uh, that's, it's very that's, easy to do. That's what they do Dennis. They gave my daughter medication and told her if she did not take the medication she could not see her child again and then one of the side effects was suicide. She overdosed on the medication and then they said now you, now you cannot have your daughter again. Um, they do anything they can to keep the, the, the person that has lost the child from actually getting the child back again. Yes, um, they do. I, I would like to say one thing before we close, Dennis. Brenda Scott has a book out, called Out of Control, Who's Watching Our Child Protection Agencies. Um, the system as it operates today should be scrapped. 
If children are to be protected in their homes in the system, radical new guidelines must be adopted. Um, there's nobody that's monitoring um, what is going on with CPS. Nobody's watching over it. Nobody's well, we have an anything. ombudsman's office, but this ombudsman's office just does reports. They could not reverse a decision. They have no power, no, no authority, and uh, it's really useless. That's right. They, they so, do what they want to do. We want to move on, too. We had another email, several emails that people think we should put faces on a board to uh, show people that have protected children to death. Uh, these would be foster parents. These would be uh, CPS workers. So we've come up with a Michigan for Parental Rights wall of shame. And we're going to start right here in, in this area, this uh, show originating from the Grand Rapids area. We're going to start with one of our own, Wall of Shame. So ladies and gentlemen, the MPR Wall of Shame. This is Joy Heaven, also known as the murderer of, of Emily Mennell. Emily wet her pants and got in Joy's way, so Joy shoved her so hard she flew and landed on her head. Emily became unconscious but collapsed. Joy then called and lied, saying that Emily had suffered an epileptic seizure. Emily was on life support for two days before she died of a severe brain injury. After death, an autopsy was performed and would shine light on the truth of Emily's last hours. Joy, after being faced with this, came clean. As far as I see, Joy is not in prison. And, um, Joy is not in prison. In fact, Joy is out on $10,000 bond right now, walking the streets, waiting for her trial on uh, murder charges on little Emily. Uh, and um, that kind of leads to another story. There was a young man that was 19 years old in Traverse City, Michigan, that killed a cat. His bond is set at $50,000, so I'm wondering why, why $10,000 for a murderer of a child. What's the price of a child? $10,000? Yes, uh, Dennis, I What's agree. more important, mm -hmm. a child's life or a cat's life? We're almost out of time today, and um, I want to thank you for joining us here at Silent Voices for this edition. Um, if you have any comments or suggestions or you'd like to be on the program, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Hey, we need your voices. Your voice is what's going to change this system. You come forward, I guarantee you, we are getting people by the day, same situation, new people all the time. We also have a social network at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Jump aboard, meet other people in the same situation. And we'll see you next time. Remember, your voice can make the difference. Goodbye.